الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي فضل الإسلام على سائر الأديان وفضل أمة الإسلام على سائر الأمم وفضل محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم على الخلق أجمعين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبد الله ورسوله أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam We thank the Almighty Allah for giving us another opportunity to be here today We thank Him for His mercies that He's bestowed upon us We bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except the Almighty Allah We also bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم is his servant and his messenger Whosoever the Almighty Allah guides is really guided, and whoever goes astray has nobody to blame but themselves. Today, I believe it's a Thursday, which corresponds with the 18th day of Dhul Qa'dah or Dhul Qa'dah, 1441 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, which also corresponds with the 9th day of July 2020. As uh, we broadcast earlier, I think yesterday, or even last week, we want to start a series on Islamic philosophy. And uh, not to look at Islamic philosophy in its entirety, but just some philosophical ideologies within Islam. 
especially looking at you know the trend that the world is moving now with the onslaught of atheism and materialism and the kind of onslaught of different ideologies that you know the young muslim faces within our muslim communities back home in ghana or anywhere in the world we need to give tools to these young muslims that will help them navigate through these, you know, storms. It's not easy, you know, being a Muslim in our current times, especially with the advent of technology, internet, where the whole world has been brought onto, you know, the same table. Ideas are being exchanged within seconds. Just a few minutes ago, I was on, you know, uh, a training session uh with Kaisid. Kaisid is the King Abdullah Ibn Abdulaziz International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue. And we are all on the same platform on a training. I'm here in America. There are people in Africa, there are people in Europe, and there are people as far as Southeast Asia, in Malaysia and Singapore. So the internet has brought people together so the bringing of people together definitely will result in the exchange of ideas so young muslims who are on the internet are faced with some of these you know phenomenon of being exposed to some of these ideas i quite remember uh, some few years ago a young man from ghana was radicalized to join isis by the, through the internet, through the internet, he was radicalized and he ended up joining ISIS. One of my friends that we are into countering violent extremism and preventing violent extremism together with in Ghana told me of a story of a boy who had already been radicalized on the internet. He was ready to join ISIS. He was planning to leave tomorrow to go and leave, join ISIS and they met him today and they spoke to him and then they were able to convince him from joining. So these are some of the, you know, dilemma and we discussed that into some detail last week in our introductory, you know, remarks on this, you know, platform. So today we're just going to look at the history of knowledge in Islam. You know, most often than not, some Muslims feel that uh, the problem of religion or the problem of Islam is that Islam is not a scientific religion. Islam is not a religion of rationality. Islam is rigid. Islam is not dynamic. Islam has nothing to do with, you know, religion has nothing to do with you no know, physical aspect of life because they see some Muslim clerics who are always spiritual and it's always spiritual for them. They don't see the other aspects of Islam where Islam talks about, you know, living life, you know, earning a living, scientific explorations, philosophical foundations, psychological makeups, you know, economics, agriculture. They don't see that aspect. And we are to blame. If we only project one aspect of Islam and leaving the other aspect, that is what is going to go on in people's minds. So I just want us to look at the history of knowledge in Islam today. The history of knowledge in Islam. You know, there have been civilizations before the Islamic civilization. There has been the Roman you know, civilization, the Greek civilization, the Mesopotamian civilization, the Indian civilization, the Chinese civilizations, even in Africa. The, the the egyptian civilization you come to south america the maya civilization so there has been civilizations before the islamic civilization no muslim scholar will tell you islam is the first you know civilization in the world it doesn't make sense it's not factually right there have been civilizations before islam but then when you check from you know AD 100, that is 100 years after the ascension of Jesus Christ, to AD 600, 
that is 500 year gap, the world had come to a standstill. After Jesus Christ left, the world came to a standstill. And the issues that the world needed to move on. So Islam came at a point whereby there had been all these, you know, chaos and confusion in the world, the Roman Empire, and then, you know, the Arabs living in, you know, their darkness and the world being engulfed in all kinds of, you know, frustration and, and problems. So the Almighty Allah sends the Prophet Muhammad for him to be a mercy to mankind. And that the advent of the Prophet Muhammad is for the whole of humanity. It's not for only Arabs. And then it's not only for Muslims. The Islamic civilization, when we go on further, we realize that in the building of the Islamic civilization, we had Jewish scholars in the courts of the Muslim rulers, the kings and the princes of the Muslim empire had Christian doctors. Salah Din was once treated by a Christian doctor. We had Jewish philosophers within the Islamic civilization. So some people, some, some historians say it is not Islamic civilization because we had all these people contributing who are not Muslims. So they call it philosophy or civilization within the Islamic, you know, Islamic world or Islamic civilization. So it's just, you know, a confusion of terminologies that people have. So Islam came at that point where the Arabs were engulfed in all kinds of problems. The Roman Empire and then the Persian Empire were very weak at that time. The Arabs, because of the desert, these empires were not able to, you know, cross into and then, you know, defeat them. So the Arabs were pure from all kinds of, you know, influence, outside influence. So it is within this scope that, you know, Islam started to develop. So when Islam came, it's very, very, it's, it's a fact that the first verse to be revealed in the Quran is Iqra, which means read. And if you read the history of the Arabs, they were not people who were lettered. They rather depended on their memories and then memorization to disseminate information or to store information. So these people were not people of writing, of documentation. But then the Quran comes with the first verse that says, Iqra, read. And the first five verses of the Quran talks about education six times. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. Alladhi ya'allama bil-qalami. Allama al-insan ma lam ya'allam. So education is spoken about six times in the first five verses of the Quran. To signify to the world that the next chapter of the world is going to be about education. The next chapter of the world is going to be about philosophical foundations. The next chapter of the world is going to be about scientific explorations. The next chapter of the world is going to be about analysis and observation, reading and writing. So Islam came to, to, to connect these older civilizations to new coming civilizations and new coming science and technology. Islam came to pull the world out of that darkness, that spans of time for 500 years after the ascension of Jesus Christ to the advent of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Islam came to shed light on these times. So you find in the Quran, the Almighty Allah says, Qul siru fil ard. Tell them, travel in the earth. Fanduru kaifa bada al khalq. And observe how the beginning of creation, how creation began. Thumba Allahu yunshu un nashat al akhira. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Another verse, Almighty Allah says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaq. We'll expose them to our signs in the horizons. Wafi anfusihim and even in themselves. Hatta yata bayyana lahum anna ul haq. 
to the time that it becomes apparent to them that is the truth. So Islam came to talk about the opening of the mind, civilization, education, exploration, science, philosophy, business management, administration. So you find a lot of the verses in the Quran speaking about that. Islam came to open the mind after the mind has been, you know, crumpled upon. The mind had been, you know, put into a box that you can think outside this box. Islam no, said, no, we are going to challenge the status quo. We are going to open the minds of people. They are going to read. They are going to understand. They are going to explore. They are going to ask questions. They are going to experiment. They are going to observe. So what the world is seeing now in terms of, you know, advancement in science, in terms of easy life, in terms of, you know, all these wonderful, you know, inventions and innovations, it is because Islam put in place a scientific methodology in terms of experiments. And all historians will bear, you know, witness the fact that is the Muslim scholars at a time whereby Europe was in its darkness, it is the Muslims who transported and transmitted and translated the sciences and then the philosophies of old Greece and Mesopotamia and, 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 and Egypt and India. They translated them into Arabic and that was later translated into Latin and then Europe became exposed to all these things so the europeans you know took this knowledge from us muslims and then they 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 modified it and made it better what happened was that after holding the torch of civilization and science and technology for 1000 years the muslims became tired they lost interest in, in, in civilization they lost interest and then they gave it up and then the Europeans picked it up and then they made it better and then they even plagiarized it yes because there are a lot of books there is this wonderful man in Germany called Fuad Siskin a Turkish who has spent 60 years of his life picking old manuscripts Latin manuscripts and then deciphering them and then trying to see where were the sources of this information in these manuscripts and then he found out that 70 to 80 percent of them are from muslim scholars what some of these european scientists do is that when they get hold of a book that has been written by a muslim and then has been translated into latin they tear off their cover and then they write their names on it so you end up finding that Oh, the father of modern day medicine, European. The father of philosophy, European. The father of uh, uh, agriculture, European. The father of optics, European. The father of Europeans. How? The world didn't have anything. The Egyptians didn't do anything. The Mesopotamians didn't do anything. The, the Indians didn't do anything. The Chinese didn't do anything. How did the Europeans who at one point labeled a point of their history as the dark ages where they didn't have anything where they didn't know anything at the time whereby it was dark ages in europe baghdad was a shining light in 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 in, in, in the middle east so how come that all forms of inventions and all forms of narrations uh, is all europeans 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 and don't forget that Muslims lived in Spain for eight centuries. There was Islamic civilization. So if you look, if you observe, you know, the Spanish people and then the Portuguese people, they don't look like mainland Europeans. They look like Arabs. Look at them. Observe the Spanish. And observe, observe the Spanish language too. Cities like Cordoba were Muslim cities. Cities like Granada were Muslim cities. So, at one point in time, we Muslims just slacked off and backed off. We became okay in our comfort zones. The Europeans 
picked up the information, the knowledge. They made it better. They took off our names of the books and then they wrote their names on the books. And then we ended up calling them the fathers of modern day philosophy, father of modern day science. You know. And apart from that, they also Latinized some of the names of our scholars. Avicina that you hear is Ibn Sina. Avaros is Ibn Rushd. Algebra is Al Jabir. Algorithms Al Khawarizmi. These were Muslim scientists who were shining light for the world. We'll come and talk about Muslim scientists, you know, in the medieval world and the kind of impact they had on modern day scientific, you know, findings and explorations. We'll even come and talk about the role of the Muslims in the discovery of America. We'll talk about that. As early as 300, 300 Hijra, there were manuscripts that pointed to the fact that the Muslims have already crossed the Atlantic Ocean and they've come to America. And that is about 900 to 1080. Five centuries before Columbus stepped on America, Muslims were here already. You know, anybody who observes the revelation of the Quran and then the arrangement of the verses, anybody who studies that will really, really bear witness to the fact that Islam came in support of the opening of the mind and then the advancement of humanity. So you have verses in the Quran, Do those who know, who have knowledge, be equal to those who do not know or those who do not have knowledge? Verily is of those who have deep minds that think. Verily, those who have knowledge, the Almighty Allah will lift them up. Those who have iman, the Almighty Allah will raise them up. But then those who have knowledge mixed up with iman, the Almighty Allah will raise them higher status. So you have Islam promoting all these things. So in Islam, from that time where you have these verses that have been revealed, the, the criteria for the judgment, for the development, for power, for dominance have been knowledge. So if you find now the advanced nations in the world are advanced because of their investment in, in education. Countries whereby teachers are, 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 are treated nice and fairly, those countries develop. Countries whereby they invest in education, those countries are developed. But countries that invest in entertainment are always at the back. And this has been a painful experience for us Muslim nations now, if you observe the Muslim nations now, they are rather interested in investing in entertainment. That's where their mind is all in. So you find out that the top, you know, entertainment hotspots in the world are in Muslim countries. No need to mention names. But then you come to the Western world and it's all about education. It's all about reading. It's all about exploration. It's all about science. It's all about education. And even in the Western world, if you come here, there are communities that are retarded, are backwards, is because the level of education in there is not high. You come to our communities back home in Ghana, and then you realize that we invest more in entertainment than in education. We give prominence to, you know, entertainers than educationists. In the end, all our celebrities are entertainers. We don't, we don't call, you know, professors celebrities we don't call lecturers you know uh, uh, celebrities we don't call all these you know doctors and engineers as celebrities the celebrities we call are all these entertainers so if you want to be famous now in ghana 
You will turn into an entertainer, especially if you begin to strip yourself naked on social media. Sadaqallah al You are done. You are gone. You become, you become the most famous of persons. So you find out that, excuse me, with all due respect, the level of foolishness in our communities are high. Come to our Muslim communities in Ghana and observe the level of investment we have in education and the level of investment we do in entertainment. Wedding ceremony, entertainment. Naming ceremony, entertainment. Even now, our food rats have now turned into entertainment. We don't invest in education at all. So you find out that these, the power and the influence that Islam had on the world is through education. So this misconception that Islam was spread by the sword is very, very apparent to the whole world now that it's not true. Because the fastest growing religion in the world now is, is Islam. Which Muslim army is moving from country to country and then putting swords on people's necks and tell them to accept Islam? Who? In America, yeah, the fastest growing religion is Islam. Which army is here shooting people and telling them to accept Islam? The biggest Muslim population of a country is, in, is Indonesia. Which Muslim army moved from the Arabian Peninsula and they came to Southeast Asia and then forced them to be Muslims? The power of Islam is in the book. It's in Quran. And that is a major miracle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So because Islam had, you know, promoted knowledge, scholars within, you know, the Islamic civilization were given prominence and importance. Knowledge was given prominence and importance in the Islamic civilization. The Prophet Muhammad never missed an opportunity to impact knowledge. He would be even sitting on a donkey with a young boy who is eight, nine years old, the prophet is sitting on the donkey with Ibn Abbas. And Ibn Abbas was only 13 years old when the prophet Muhammad died. And he, Ibn Abbas narrates that I was sitting on the same donkey with the prophet Muhammad one day. And the prophet Muhammad told him, Ya Gulam, inni u'allimuka kalimatin he says, the Prophet Muhammad said, Oh boy, listen, I'm going to teach you some words. So the Prophet Muhammad doesn't miss an opportunity to teach, doesn't miss an opportunity to impact knowledge, doesn't miss an, doesn't miss an opportunity to, to advance the course of knowledge and seeking knowledge. So you find Jibreel all the time coming to him. You find that the closest companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were scholars. Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali, wonderful scholars. You find out that his wives, Aisha Ummul Muminin, you find out Hafsa, scholars. Anas Bum Malik, scholars. Abu Huraira, scholars. And these people were like, you know, smartphones. They weren't writing. They were memorizing, they were memorizing everything. So you find that Aisha having more than 2,000 narrations. You find Jabir ibn Abdullah. You find Abu Sa'id al Khudri. You have Anas bin Malik. You have Abdullah ibn Abbas. You have uh, Nana Aisha. You have Abu Huraira. These people have narrated more than 1,000 narrations from the Prophet Muhammad. At a time whereby we didn't have smartphones to, 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 you know, to, to download and cover everything. At a time whereby it was not as if they had books that they were writing. No, he speaks and then they memorize. The companions challenged it themselves. They competed against each other in terms of knowledge seeking. They encouraged each other. Umar bin Khattab narrates that he had, you know, uh, a neighbor. And what he and the neighbor used to do was that if the neighbor goes 
to school to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam today, he Umar will go to the markets to go and do business. So when he comes back home, the neighbor will teach him what the neighbor learned from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he will also give the neighbor what the neighbor needs for that day in terms of food and sustenance. The following day, they change, they exchange positions. So you find out that within the Sahaba, Ali ibn Abi Talib always speaking wisdom. Mu'ad ibn Jabal was knowledgeable in halal and haram. Zaid ibn Thabit was another ocean in terms of faraid, estates devolution. That is, if someone dies, how to distribute their estates. So he learned mathematics too. Yes, he learned mathematics. Zaid ibn Thabit was a bilinguist. He studied the Hebrew language in 17 days, together with the Arabic language. So he was a secretary. Ibn Abbas was a phenomenon when it comes to, you know, interpretation and exegesis and commentary. Now, after the Prophet Muhammad and then the Sahaba, we're speaking about the history of knowledge. So I'm taking us chronologically the history of Islam and then how knowledge was, you know, exposed within the history of Islam. You know, after the Islamic State has, you know, been established, the empire has been established, there was no fear of invasion. The state has been established. You find Imam al-Bukhari, he comes in and he compiles these narrations. Before him, people like Imam Malik and Abu Hanifa, scholars. You find Imam Ahmad bin Khanbal spending 25 years of his life to compile his Musnad, which contains 40,000 narrations from the Prophet Muhammad At that time frame, the Muslims were only concerned about, you know, Sharia, spiritual, you know, knowledge, and then what they are going to take day-to-day -day activities in terms of their businesses there was there was no you know uh, uh, what do you call it serious need for other sciences because of the situations and the conditions that they were in but then when the Islamic Empire expanded and then the Romans came in the Persians came in then these ideologies that these people from other civilizations were bringing in became a threat. Why? Greek philosophies came in with all their myth and then their gods. Islam is a religion of Tawheed. Only one God. The Greeks worship many gods. The Hindus worship many gods. So when these people accepted Islam or when they came into contact with Muslims and the Muslim civilization, they brought with them ideologies that clashed with the Muslim ideology of Tawhid. So how will the Muslims be able to protect Tawhid from these ideologies? So that began the translation movement. The Muslim kings at that time in safeguarding Islam said, no, what we are going to do now is we have to translate these books, these philosophical books, these scientific books of Ptolemy and, you know, all these Greek scientists and all these Indian scientists and all these Indian mathematicians and all these, you know, books of Aristotle and, uh, and, and Plato and and Socrates, these philosophical ideas or ideologies that have the tendency of, you know, crashing with Islam, we need to translate them and then understand them better. If we understand them, then we'll be able to put in place countermeasures that will protect what? Tawheed. 
So the first you know, reason for the translation movement in Islam was to protect the weight. Because these people who have accepted Islam and have come into Islam, or those people who didn't accept Islam, but then they came in with their civilization to mix with the Muslim civilization, had brought with them ideologies that were weird in Islam. The concept of Trinity, the concept of many gods, the concept of God having a son, the concept of God having a wife and a lover, the concept of God turning into a human being to come and have sexual relations with women, these were all alien and foreign to Islam. So the Muslim kings at that time decided, no, 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 we need to, you know, see if we need to protect the Muslim to aid. So we need to translate these books into Arabic and then we give them to our theologians, the Muslim scholars, and then they will read and say, mm -mm, this is not in tandem with Islam. No, this, oh, as for this, we can use. As for this, we can use. As for this, we can use. Apart from that, the need to have a central government for the Muslim nation was very, very important because now the empire has stretched. They were building new cities, so education was important, healthcare was important, road networks was important, you know, because of Salat, and then the difference in time zones, the importance of astronomy became important. Military intelligence became important. Healthcare, economics. So they now had to explore deeper. So what other civilizations have already, you know, done? What the Chinese have done? What the Indians have done? What the Persians have done, what the Greeks have done, what the Romans have done, and what the Egyptians have done. If you look at the map of the world, you realize that the Muslim Empire was in the middle of the known world at that time. So everybody was trying to have access to the Muslim Empire. So they brought with them all these civilizations and all this knowledge and all these signs. So what the Muslim scholars did was that, okay, they pick the books of Aristotle and then they translate them. They pick the books of Ptolemy and then they translate them. They pick the books of these Persian scientists, they translate them. They pick the books of Hindu mathematicians, they translate them into Arabic. And that helped them in taking care of their health care, in taking care of you know, business, in taking care of the military, in taking care of you know, building new cities, in taking care of even riding the sea boats because the muslims wanted to maintain their power as you know the biggest you know power at that time they wanted to maintain their dominance so they will have to inculcate you know civilizations from across the world so you find out that because of this Scholars became prominent and science prospered and knowledge moved on and scholars were what? Were paid very well. Ma'moon, one of, you know, the Abbasid caliph, Ma'moon, the son of Harun al-Rashid, he has a guy who translates for him who is called Hunayn ibn Ishaq. Hunayn ibn Ishaq was a Christian and non Muslim. When Hunayn translates a book from Greek into Arabic, that book is weighed on a scale. And if the book weighs 10 kilos, he is given 10 kilos of gold as the price for his job. Imagine these professors that we have who are writing wonderful books and then we weigh the book and then the book is 20 kilograms and then we give him the weight of that in gold. You think our scholars will, will, will just be around just anyhow? Look at the kind of the way the scholars are suffering back home in Ghana and look at how tired they are and look at how misused we are using them. 
Look at how derogatory we are dealing with them. At the peak of Islamic civilization, if you write a book, a book, the book is put on a scale, it is weighed. And how much it will weigh, you'll be given that amount in gold. And then you don't have people that you hate today, except the malams, the scholars. They are the ones you hate. They are the ones you always have problems with. They are the ones you always challenge. So, Hunayni, Ibn Ishaq, a non-Muslim, living in the Muslim empire, living with the, empire, the emperor, Mus a non-Muslim living with a Muslim emperor is his translator from Arabic from, from Greek into Arabic. Someone comes to the name, he tells me that Muslims are not tolerant people. And those of us Muslims who feel every non-Muslim is useless, is bogus, go back into our history and see how we live with non-Muslims. When Abu Ubaid Qasim ibn Salam wrote his book, Garib al-Hadith, the king of Khorasan at that time, who was called uh, Abdullah ibn Tahir, said, in a mind that is able to conjure something like this, it's not a mind that we must joke with or play with. He pays him 10,000 pieces of gold monthly. Scholars in Islamic civilization were paid 10,000 pieces of gold. A month, he's giving 10,000 pieces of gold. Can you imagine you're being paid $10,000 a month for just a scholar writing? If Muslims will return to that point in time whereby scholars, scientific innovations, educations have, is given prominence, we pay people $10,000 a month for writing books. We will control the world. We will rule the world. And this is what the Westerners are doing. Scholars and education is giving prominence. So they are always challenging themselves to produce more. They are always challenging themselves to explore more. They are always challenging themselves to write more, to explore more. Because the incentives and the motivation is there. But then we know, if you want to be famous, be an entertainer. Strip yourself naked. You get more likes on Facebook. Be foolish and people will love you. When Al-Asfahani wrote his book al aghani uh, the king at that time, Al Mustansir, when he had the book about that, this is what this guy has written a book. He sent him thousand pieces of gold free of charge as a gift. He sent him thousand pieces of gold as a gift. So, Muslims of today who think that Islamic civilization. It's just about chopping of heads and flogging people and oppressing women. It has got nothing to do with science. For him, he is read scientific and he's oh no, hey. So he has doubts about his religion and he is ready to listen to what other civilizations have. And then he prefers other civilizations on Islamic civilization. He is a Muslim. He has this dilemma. Yes, we have Muslims who have that dilemma that. No, others are doing better than us. Uh, he has the Iman, but then he looks at the state of the Muslims now in the world and then he's not proud to be a Muslim because he's read all kinds of, you know, scientific, you know, uh, uh, papers, scientific works. He's read about all kinds of scientists and then he doesn't see any Muslim name in there. He looks at the Muslim nations and it's all about, uh, so he's confused. I'm bringing to you these facts today so that you understand what really went on in Islamic civilization. So this, you know, gifts to scholars and then it became a form of competition between the kings at that time. 
So if any scholar, you know, rests his head, writes a wonderful book in science and technology, writes any book in hadith and tafsir, writes any book in, 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 in engineering, writes any book, then the, scholar, then the kings will be competing. You know, it's like modern day soccer, where a new star comes up and then the big clubs will be flexing their muscles, I'll pay $120 million, I'll pay, that's what happened at that time. Scholars were in high demand. So they began also traveling. The scholars started traveling. They moved. So you find that during the time of uh, 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 Hisham ibn al-Hakam, you find Sa'id al-Baghdadi traveled to him. Al-Hassan ibn al-Haytham traveled from Baghdad, Iraq, to Egypt. Why? Because at that time, the Egyptians had problem with the Nile. The Nile was overflowing. And it was causing them damages to their crops. So the king invited him. Al-Hakim bi Amrillah invited Al-Hassan ibn al-Haytham to come and find scientific solutions to the problem that they were facing with the Nile River. Put this name at the back of your mind. Al-Hassan ibn al-Haytham will come and speak about him. And some of his inventions and some of his contributions to science and the development of science. Because we are Africans, I'm an African and I'm come, I come from West Africa. I want us to look at some of these things in West Africa too. Yes. Africans were not living in trees and then they were not only carrying on leaves and then running about hunting for antelopes and then just like that and then it is when the Europeans came to Africa kind that is when our eyes opened no we were civilized at a time where the Europeans didn't know anything in West Africa we all know of Mansa Musa Mansa Musa who lived in the 12th 13th 14th century thereabouts Christopher Columbus, the, the, the Europeans, or Christopher Columbus, went to America in the 15th century. Don Diego de Azambuja came to Ghana in the 15th century. But then in the 14th century, Mansa Musa, a Muslim king, had traveled from West Africa to Mecca for Hajj. And he had 60,000 soldiers with him going from West Africa to Mecca. And then he carried with him tons of gold. His journey, his journey from Mali to Mecca changed the economies of the, every, every village, every town that he would pass through. He changes the economies of these cities and these towns it is reported that every place or every city or every town he passed he built a mosque there before he moves on this is what we had in africa before the european came we knew how to mine our gold and refine it the Mali Empire had a standing force, an army of 60,000 soldiers. People were dressed in gold. Gold was the currency. So if someone comes and then he says, it is the Europeans who came and then they, they open our eyes to what? Our eyes to what? So Mansa Musa, Askia Muhammad also in the Songhai Empire, and this is, this is also another information. If you when we were taught social studies in JSS, we were not told that these empires, Ghana Empire, Mali Empire, Songhai Empire, they were Muslim empires. I don't know what the Ghana Education Service wanted to achieve by that. It was never mentioned to us. It is not in the books. 
they only touch on its surface and then they go because these empires were Muslim and if these empires were Muslim and then they were there before the Christian missionaries came from Europe to West Africa then it means Islam was in Africa long before the Christians came and Islam had a civilization in place for Africa for West Africa the Europeans came and then they disrupted it and they destroyed it with their Christianity so Christian brothers and friends don't feel shy we know it and don't be sad we know whatever whatever is going on we understand we know it it was just a plot a ploy to just make you feel irrelevant you're relevant but then the reality is that Ghana Empire had 44 kings before Islam and they had 44 kings after Islam and us at 60 Hijra 50 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the capital city of the Ghana Empire called Kumbi Saleh had 12 masjid for Juma. Yes, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died in 632 AD plus 50. So 682 AD, 682 AD, as far back as the 7th century, Ghana Empire, Mauritania area to Senegal, had 12 masjid in the capital. Read the history of Timbuktu. Read the history of Walata, Jene, Hamdallah. Come to the Sokoto empires. Come to the Kanan Borno empires. These were Muslim empires. By Africans, by blacks. They had a system of organization. They had a system of knowledge. They had a system going on. The kings of the Islamic Empire of Masina. Read about the Islamic Empire of Masina. Read about that too. So those brothers who are calling for us to return back to Islamic uh, to African roots, return back to African roots. You've not read anything about African history. If you really, really read about African history, you will understand the role Islam played in Africa. And how Islam propelled Africa into greater heights. And the role of the Muslims when they came into Africa and how they dealt with Africans. If you come to the Sokoto Caliphate that you have now, wonderful caliphate, historical caliphate. I have very close friends who are you know, princes in that caliphate. Wonderful people, great people, knowledgeable people. Their grandfather, Uthman ibn Fodio, and his brother, Abdullah ibn Fodio, and his son, Muhammad Bello. These three names, I want you to Google them and search about them. Uthman ibn Fodio. Abdullah Bunfodio and Muhammad Bello. Google them and read about them. It is said that these three men left behind literature. Literature. When I say literature, not literature, that means books in etiquettes, in adab, in poetry, that nobody, all of them combined together, in the history of West Africa, nobody has written before or after them what they have written. Let me repeat this. These three men, Uthman ibn Fodio, Abdullah ibn Fodio, and Muhammad Bello, combined together, combined their works, their writings and these guys were kings 
Abdullah bin Fudio was a king, a king who was an author, a king who writes, a king who is a scholar. They brought what they brought together. <clears throat> no family has written anything before them or after them. Uh, ya Allah. Where did we go wrong as Africans? Muslim Africans, what happened? Where did we go wrong? This is our history. It's a history of civilization, a history of knowledge, a history of science, a history of documentation. What happened? A lot happened during colonization. And we'll come and speak about that. A lot happened during colonization and how our books were stolen and taken to Europe. Sometimes they just say they stole idols. That's what they say sometimes. They stole idols. Just to let you know and to confuse you that when they came, they met your grandparents as idol worshippers. So they say, oh, we are ready to return the artifacts that we took from Africa. We are ready to return the artifacts. No, you didn't steal only idols. You stole idols from those who were worshipping idols. You stole books too. You stole knowledge. That's what you did. Go to all these museums in, 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 in the Western world and you find our books there. We'll come and talk about that into details, but I'm just giving you a historical, you know, information concerning how knowledge was in Islam. West Africa has had its share. We've talked about the Middle East. You know, we've talked about Spain. Learning centers like Cordova. Learning centers like Garnata. Learning, learning centers like Ispilia. Learning centers like Toledo. Toledo. Toledo that you hear in Spain. Toledo. Toledo. Ispilia. Spanol, <laughs> you hear all these were Muslim centers. And read about Fernando and Isabella, King Fernando and Isabella, and what they did to Muslims in Spain. What they did to Muslims and Jews in Spain. Read about that. And read about what happened to Jews in Europe and the role of Muslims in helping the Jews when they were being persecuted in Europe. This is also another lesson that we will tackle in this philosophy class. Whoa. Today is introduction. We're just going to have an hour of it. Not more than that. And inshallah, next week on Thursday, we're going to look at learning centers in the Islamic world. Learning centers in the Islamic world. So that you Muslims and non-Muslims will understand what Islam really entails. We are do I'm doing this. We want to look at knowledge and knowledge seeking, learning centers. We'll look at the translation movement. We will look at key translators in the Islamic in the Islamic civilization. We will look at libraries in the Islamic world. Then we will enter into issues of philosophy, of deism, of atheism, and whether it has. How is that? So we will look at science and atheism. Some people think if you are a scientist, you must be an atheist. Straightforward. No. So please, if you have any questions, we'll entertain them. So that next week, we'll look at learning centers. And did schools only start in the West? We'll look at them. We'll see learning centers in West Africa long before the European came. We'll see them. And we'll give you their locations. We'll look at translation movements and the reasons behind the translation movements. And then the key translators in the translation movements. And then we'll look at libraries 
in Islam. Library, yes, library, libraries, libraries, libraries that you Muslims no longer have. You go to Accra and then you can count the number of Muslim libraries we have. It's very, very painful. It's very, very painful. You come to Accra, you can count the number of Muslim libraries we have. Muslims are only interested in entertainment now. That's it. Muslims in Ghana, we produce a lot of scholars. And up to now, we have them. The national chief imam, his son, Sheikh Yael Amin, has books that he has written in Arabic. Wonderful scholar in terms of Arabic poetry and language. People like Umar Kriki, people like Afa Ajura, Sheikh Habibullah Abdul Samad. Muslim writers, they've written books, both from Al Sunnah and both from Tijaniya. How well are we preserving those books? How well have we documented them? We don't. Now the Muslim is only interested in entertainment. That's all. We are not interested in what is going to develop our communities. It's only entertainment. Weekends, we've blocked all kinds of shit. Even within this COVID-19 era, we had the audacity to organize entertainment for our living. That's, that's what we know how to do. Spending money on unnecessary things. But education, no. How many of us sponsor lecture sessions in our masjids? Even if you even organize the lecture sessions, people will not come. I organize lectures and we bring in international scholars. If the international scholar is not known, nobody comes there. We find it difficult parking the place. But if the international scholar is known, yeah, people will troop and come in. And they want us to make it free too. We invite a scholar. We will foot his bills, his air flights, in and out, his accommodation. His food, his transportation, we will hide the venue, we'll bring in chairs. People help. Yes, people help. People sponsor. Yes. But those who come and listen, let them pay 10 Ghana CD and enter. Ah, so I said the Allah. You are selling the word of Allah. So for the Muslim in Ghana to dip his hands into his pocket to help. An education course. No, 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 not at all. He wouldn't get anything from there, so no. But then look at the pomposity and pageantry and with impunity that our Muslim communities invest in entertainment. Our sisters, they dance away their dignities on the streets of Accra and Nima. They dance away their dignities. From Asr, 3.30, if you have a car in Nima, drive outside and go and park at Nima that about or at Accra Girls. Because it is no way, no way, no way, no way that is going to meet you in the face. And we have people who pay as much as 500 Ghana CD for a spinner to come and spin for 2-3 hours. And if the Amaria has friends, it becomes competition. Nina Inawa, Kema Kinaki, Kowa Inashi, everybody should do his own. So if she has four friends and each one is doing 500 Ghana CD, 500 Ghana CD for a spinner, four of them is 2,000 Ghana CD. This is just to invite the spinner. I'm not talking about the things that they buy, Kai Rabo. The things that they buy, kind of, but we've not yet come to it. Just to invite a spinner to come and play music, disturb the community, 
500 Ghana CD, 4, 2,000 Ghana CD. And then we do this, 2,000 Ghana CD. If the whole of Nima, we have at least 10 marriages, only 10, only 10. And I know every weekend in Nima, we have more than 2,000 marriages, but the girls are not finishing. Why? Because we based our marriages on the wrong premise. You invite Malams in the morning to come and do Fatiha, Lila, Vinans, and now they read all the Quran, Allah, Sal, Barakah. And then in the evening, you invite Shaitan. And you think your marriage will last. And the most dangerous thing that is going on now is this reception that you have, have concocted, this new bidah. Oh no, Ashad, number Muslim, Chibani. So what are you going to do? Now we are going to, you know, uh, uh, turn it, reception. The reception is more dangerous than the Ashad. Do you know why? The Asha, it is only girls who are dancing. The reception, you, you've brought men and women together. And then they say, oh, we, we don't play, we play halal music. My Zayn. For the rest of my life, I'll be with you. I stay by your side. On and send through to the end of my day. I'll be loving you. Loving you. For the rest of my life. Who told you it's halal music? Who lied to you? You're 2,000 times 10. That is 20,000 Ghana CD. So in Nima, in a week, you spend 20,000 Ghana CDs on dancing. 200 million. 200 million on dancing. A week. A month is 800 million. Every month. Nima, we spend 800 million on dancing. In 10 months, we spend 8 billion in dancing. That's 800,000 Ghana CD. 8 billion. So within 10 months, the people of Nima can finish that drainage that my brother Salif Abdul Ghaffan is always crying. Fix the drainage, fix the drainage, fix the drainage, fix the drainage. In 10 months, we can fix the drainage and build schools. 8 billion cities. In 10 years, we spent 80 billion cities on dancing alone. A community doesn't have, that doesn't have a single senior high school. There is no senior high school, one, even in Nima, not even one. If there is, show it to me. Senior high school, SSS in Nima, show me one. But you have the audacity to spend 8 billion cities within a year on dancing alone. And you want to develop. And you say you are developed. And you say you are wise. And you say your eyes are open. When you spend 8 billion cities on dancing your dignities away on the streets. When you don't have enough schools, you don't have hospital. The whole of Nima, you don't have hospital. Mamubi Polyclinic is a polyclinic. They just changed their name to hospital. And that has been the problem. <laughs> How many libraries do we have in Nima? There's the Kanda Highway Library. There's the Imam Khomeini Library in, in Mamoudi. There's the Library in Institute of Islamic Studies Research. These are only three libraries I know. In Nima, Mamoudi. These are the only three libraries that I know. No senior high school. Three libraries. No hospital. Just clinics. But then you are selling your lands on the streets. You are giving it to estate developers to build to build shops so that you get money. That's 
that's what you do. You are building shops. Look at Nima Highway now. Nima has become an industrial area. Look at the Nima Highway. From runabout to conquer, there is no house now by the street. It's all shops. Shop, 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 shop. Banks, left, right, and center. No schools. You, you don't want to be educated. You are not interested in being educated. Is that it? How many of us live in Nima and then we went to secondary school in Nima? Nobody. Anybody who went to school in Nima, secondary school, had to board Trotro to go to Osu Presec or La Presec or Accra High or Accra Girls. Someone will say Accra Girls is in Nima. Accra Girls is not in Nima. It is Iowa, so where's where we're going? None of us went to school, secondary school in Nima. Either you walk to Accra High or you bought Osu Presec, La Presec, Salem, you go to Krimeto, you go to Orali. These are the schools. When the previous government was building community day schools, did we lobby for even one? The 123 that are different stages of completion, do we have one? Do we lobby for one? We don't, we don't have anybody to blame but ourselves. You can't blame anybody on this situation. We have to blame ourselves because if the mentality is not changed, we can't do anything better for ourselves. And until we realize we are Muslims and that Islam has a code of ethics and Islam has given us a rudiment for life and for living, we will always remain in darkness. They will always remain at the back log. The only time you see us debating on social media is on politics and on football. That's it. We call each other names. Now that we are in the political season, we are calling each other names. Me, I'm even looking for the unfriend button on my Facebook. You talk trash, I unfriend you. I'm not against you doing politics, but I don't do it pedestrian. Don't do it just anyhow. I respect all of you who are here. I respect to you a lot. But please, if you're going to give me a headache because of political rantings, I'll unfriend you. After January 2021, you, I will return the friend request. So please, let's... Yes, our mentality can be changed. It will take time. We need serious education. And the places we can start from is the massage, the communities. Success Book Club in Nima is doing something wonderful. They are having their readings on the streets in Nima. I applaud it. If people can fool on the streets, why can't we read on the streets? If people can fool, can block the streets and fool. Why can't you also block the streets and read? Oh, why did this people block the road? Oh, there are guys who are reading. To, 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 to inspire that culture of reading. It's high time the lectures that we are having should be on the streets too. Yes. The malam will come and then they will spread their mat on the street. Yes. With the book and then students will come and sit and then we study. What are you doing? Yes, we are studying on the street. Yes, we are studying on the street. Because some people who are fooling have blocked the streets. And we want to conscientize the community. Anyway, thank you.
you very much for watching us. Uh, I've taken much of your time and I have another class to to teach. Yes, you shall have a Zoom class now to teach. So um, we'll meet again next week Thursday, inshallah. But if you have any questions, you have any suggestions, you can send them in my inbox. If you have any questions, any suggestions, please don't send it here on live feed after we finish the program. I will not be able to see it. But if you send it in my inbox, inshallah, I'll be able to see it in the inbox. Thank you very much. Jazakum Allah khairan. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fi al-akhirat hasana. Wa kina adab al-nar. Rabbana la tuzuk kulubana ba'da idha hadaytana. Wa amla la minna dunka rahman. Naka anta al-wahab. Rabbana naka jamun nasir min al-arada fi. Inna la la akhuf min al-ad. Subhanakum alhamdulillah. Nashar Allah ila ila anta. Astaghfirukum wa tuhu ilayk. Subhanahu wa rabbika rabbil izzati wa ma yasifun. Wa salamu ala al-musalim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum.